Hi, I'm Taj Tashambe, your host of See Things From Our Side. Today, sitting down with me, I have Oakland's own, my brother, Mr. Fab. Let's go. So Fab, as a natural born hustler, businessman, entrepreneur, tell us how you've traversed the terrain in Oakland and beyond. I mean, as, as an artist, as a businessman, what's that journey been like for you? Navigating those terrains are, um, I think the verb is transitioning. Mm. You know, facts I haven't thoroughly transitioned yet. Right. Because I'm learning, and it's a learning process. Right. Um, I haven't figured it out. Some of these things are very new to me. Right. Um, the natural instinct of survival has been defined as hustler, where we come from. To us, it was just surviving. Right. But when they looked at it and they put words to it, it was, well, you're a hustler. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So to embark upon that journey and that take you so far mm. to get into the next level where now the challenge is, how do I go from hustler to businessman? Right. And transitioning, just doing that, accumulating the businesses that I have thus far, looking for more businesses to expand and expound on. Right. This empire that we're building, um, it's different. Well, take us back. Take us back to NSO, Northside Oakland, for those of you who don't know. Your journey from that period of your life, the beginning, you rap a lot about your origin story. But for viewers who don't know about Oakland, don't know about Mr. Fab, what do people need to know about you and, and your journey? I think the journey has been rigorous. Mm. It's been difficult. It's been turbulent. There was no silver response. Right. It wasn't given to me. Um, and the FSC stages of my origin, it's very difficult. Sure. You grow with pants that are addicted to drugs. And I think a lot of times I always kind of like throw my parents under the bus and I've been a little more forgiving as I get older. Mm -hmm. They were just dealing with what they were dealing with and they were still young and dealing with temptations of living life and the pressures of life at that time. Right. The peer pressures and during that time, the epidemic of the drugs was very inviting. Right. And as a kid, you are quick to throw your parents under the bus, but you don't understand what they were up against. So as you get older, you begin to become more forgiving. That's right. And then you begin to look at your life a little bit more and say, well, I never talk about my drug addictions or the other addictions that I was addicted with that my parents helped me get through or my mother helped me get through it. So just dealing with that, man, my mother was a very hard worker. My father was a hustler, a street hustler. Um, and the that coding of DNA was inevitable for me to be anything what, what I am. Yeah. And um, I persevered. Absolutely. I'm persevering through that road of not having it easy, but to being able to say the hand I didn't fold, I actually played it until it got better and it's getting better. Right. And I'm, I'm here for those moments. Absolutely. So for you, your upbringing, when did you start to really channel into your talent as an artist, as a, as a lyricist? because you're one of those, the most well-known freestyle artists of all time. I mean, I've seen you on The Breakfast Club. I've seen you with Sway in the morning, really understanding your, your talent and knowing that you had a gift. When did you, when did you tap into that? Um, first of all, thank you. I mean, yeah. I appreciate that. I'm always open for receiving the flowers, man. You got to, that. you got um, to. I think around the time my father died. Okay. My father died when I was 12. Um, I had just turned 12. My father had died from AIDS. Okay. At that time, the greater part of the black community only associated AIDS with uh, what the public would give it. It was right. a disease from, you know, right. if you know, you know. Right. Um, definitely not trying to offend anyone, but if you know, you know. And in the community, that pressure was a lot to deal with for a kid. Absolutely. 
You know, people are like, oh, your dad got me. Right. Um, ignorant to the fact of, you know, it was, he was addicted to heroin and sharing needles and things like that. Dealing with that drawback and the backlash that I was dealing with that of being young and not knowing and not understanding. Right. I think totally, I confided to my notebook. Mm. And my notebook became best friend. So that's where I relieved everything. And I right. released everything that I was going through for losing my father and watching my mother recover sure. from drugs. Um, so you were journaling. Journaling. That's Poetic too. journaling. Poetically. Did you have one notebook or did you have a series of notebooks? At first it was just one notebook. Okay. And I would jot it down and- You still have it? I do. That should be in the museum, dog. I like, don't do. sleep. Don't I sleep do. on that. Keep it somewhere safe. I have a lot of my early <laughs> notebooks. Yeah. Um, I go back to them sometimes. And it's very humbling. Sure. Because I would date them. Mm. And so for me to be able to look at that and say, damn, I wrote this in 93. Wow. I wrote this here. I wrote that there. Um, I think the exposure came from one day. I was actually violated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, my teacher looked at my notebook and read a poem. Wow. Of mine. And I didn't know how to take it at first. I was like. She read it in the classroom? No, she just read it. To herself. To herself. Okay, but she was she is in your space. Yeah, I'm like, why would you do that? Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you right. know, at that time, I wasn't, um, I wasn't confident with, sure. you know, releasing yeah. some of the things that I was dealing with. It was with personal. At the time, it was very personal. Yeah. I was like, why would you do that? Right. And she just, she, she's like, you have a gift. Like, you're, you know, you're mm -hmm. amazing, you. What I just read, like, I, I couldn't believe it. She was, she was in tears and she was telling me about it. And she was just telling me at the time, I thought it was just blowing smoke about yeah. how, you know, the right. writer I was, hey man, I was 12 years old, 13 years old. And I think that's when I began to actually see that I had something. That's dope. That's dope. So from there, once you knew you had the gift, who were some of your inspirations? I know you and I share one. I'm gonna let you tell them who it is though. You think about the town and you think about artists that took it all the way, that achieved success that we dreamed about as kids. I know one person we've talked about, but who were some of your influences early on? Nobody's bigger than MC Hems. My man. Shout out, shout out to the true legend. Like, shout like, out to him. I'm like, I still get starstruck every time I see MC Hems. He's amazing, man. Like, and, and this is my friend. Right. Like this is someone right. who's been a mentor for me. Absolutely. Who's supported all of my community ventures. Uh, ventures. He's done everything for me, man. He's given yeah. me so much motivation since a kid before I met him. Right. He was my hero. Right. When I met him, uh, his heroism went further because there's a weird saying that one should never meet their heroes. Right. Right. Because you might be disappointed. You might be disappointed. Right. You know, and um, it's for a person that believed in Santa Claus their whole life to find out that he wasn't true. Right. Don't no spoil it for the kids, man. You know what I mean? but, 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 but you know, for those, right, right, right. No, for those seriously. People, for yeah. you know, the, the spoilers. That's what it is. So they say, you know, never meet your heroes. But man, I got a chance to be my hero, and man. he was worthy of everything that I once, you know, absolutely dumped into it and still dumping. So, Hammer, too short. Um, too short has taken me under his tutelage as Michael Sun. Right. Like I refer to him as Pops. Um, for what he's shown me is the godfather of West Coast music. Absolutely. Um, he's one of the most humblest human beings that I've ever saw. When you began to break down resumes and accolades, he far outweighs some of the f the best of the best. Right. And they never give him his credit for it. Not at all. Um I'm sure. Are we just talking about Oakland? Your influences. I mean, obviously, I want the Oakland influences. Yeah, that, I mean, uh, the Oakland, those are, you know, yeah. short and hammer, uh, you know, very, very big. Um, of right. course, 40 Of course. Um, for what he's done for so many years and his ability to continue to reinvent himself. Man. Snoop Dogg has been a great inspiration. Absolutely. And I would say overall, my, my like, my last one would be Hove. You know, Hove. Jay yeah. Um, I tell people this all the time. 
Like we're looking at somebody who we know on record who was involved in a high level of street activity. <laughs> Facts. Like yeah. in transparency, if we being honest, like this this is the same dude that sold crack. This is true. Like this is true. And now we're talking about billion dollar hoes. Right. Like you know what I'm saying? Right. Like right. the ultimate. In front of our eyes. Yeah. So for the fact for the past twenty years, we've watched the elevation right. of a man go from his friends trying to convince him to take music seriously. Mm. Mm. to taking music seriously, to treating the music industry like the street game. Right. Being able to emulate some of the same numbers that he was able to do in the streets, amplify and magnify times whatever. Right. Now we're talking about a man dropping a verse a couple weeks ago saying, it's four billionaires that I've created for my lineage. Ooh. That's, that's just unbelievable, brother. That's heavy. That's heavy. That's just for billionaires. For billionaires. We're not right. talking about right. the, millionaires the millionaires that he's created. Yeah. Just that's off it. just off the lyrics. It's black excellency. That's black excellency, man. Exactly. And I, and I appreciate you being here today because that's what I feel like has inspired a lot of our generation, you know, especially now, to be entrepreneurs, to be creators, right, of content and you know, taking it to the next level, right? In terms of how we need to own the content too, how we need to monetize it, how we need to license our own things. So thinking of, you got the Dope Era brand, you got the cap on the day. Talk, talk to me about Dope Era. Talk to me about how you came up with this brand. Now we understand the origin story that you share with us, but how did you come up with Dope Era as a brand? and take that to the heights that has reached so far. And I know it's still growing, obviously, but what inspired you to create the brand? Well, you got me in real rare form today. I got, <laughs> got the baby oil on the feet, <laughs> toes out, shorts in the bucket, you know? Hey. Flip-flops in the bucket hats, baby. <laughs> uh, it's crazy, man. Um, for people that don't know what Dope Bear actually is. Break it down for me. Um, you know, our, our version of Dope Bear is, is known through the clothes of what we've done through fashion. Right. Um, my brothers and I, of what we were able to curate and curating. But when we dig deeper into it, you know, and we begin to search in the crevice of it. Talk to me. We realized what the Dope Bear actually was. In the 80s, they had a war on drugs. Right. I like to get to the history of why there was a war on drugs. You know, before you get to the secondary, you must always address the primary. Right. And in addressing the primary, the reason why there was a war on drugs, especially here in Oakland, California, because of the high level of self-consciousness mm -hmm. and the social relevance that the Black Panthers created. Um, unfortunately, for someone who went out to help their people and be as dedicated as they were. Right. We saw Huey Newton become America's public enemy number one. Mm. When you think of the public enemies that um, history has shown us, you look at everybody else on that list, and to me it's, why is this man there? Right. Like, you know what I mean? You look right. at the Saddam Hussein's and the Arafat's, right. and Joseph Stalin's and the Adolf Hitler's. And right. Why is our brother on here? Why is this man, on this list, <laughs> like, you, you know, <laughs> right. what, what did he do? Right, right. But he threatened the consciousness level. Right, waking people up. And that just lets you know how powerful mm. that black thought and black excellency is. Right. How it's important for us to embody as black designers mm. and not just designers of fashion, but designers of culture, designers of content. Right. Designers of... Um, everything that we're building and creating. So fast forwarding, um, they began to employ drugs in the communities mm -hmm. and the black communities to destroy that high level of self-consciousness um, because it was a threat. It was a threat to the Central Intelligence of America, understanding the way that it would create. You sure. wake these people up of how conscious they were. And they began to flood drugs in all the communities, man, especially high levels of um, 
black dominance and Absolutely. black prominence. You know, they destroyed a lot of communities. And they talk about the bombs and we talk about the bombs of Tulsa, of them destroying Tulsa, Oklahoma. Right. But one of the biggest bombs that's never mentioned along the atom bomb and along the Hiroshima and a lot of the other things that they never talk about, the drug bomb that they dropped in our communities. And they dropped these bombs and it didn't become a nuclear war until it began to affect their doorsteps. Right. In Oakland, California, Nancy, Re Nancy Reagan, Ronald Reagan, they created this Just Say No campaign. Right. That she was in Oakland, California when she created the Just Say No. Wow. Uh, campaign. And the Just Say No was a war on drugs. Mm -hmm. It was to fight the drugs and it was such a hypocrisy just based off the fact of Reagan's dealings with Oliver Dorf and everything else with the drugs of how you were one of the first persons to allocate the flow of drugs into America. Right. And now you're fighting against them. Wow. Uh. Um, and that became known as the dope bear. And that was the dope bear. And in my mind, everything in that era was dope except for the dope. Uh. And I wanted to have a name that was a reflection of that. I love it. When me and my brothers created it, it was like, let's create all the things that was dope in that era without the dope and do it through fashion and rekindle memories of promising moments for us in our communities. So you mentioned the dope era, Fab, and you took it and spun it on his head and everything dope but the dope from the era. And I think as a culture, it's interesting that we have done that with words. We've done that with intentions that were set to harm us and flip them. So in that flip, in that process of flipping things, where do you think we can take it next? How do we take what has been done to our community, to our culture, and elevate from where we are today. The biggest flip that needs to happen is regentrification. Mm. I think the only way to combat gentrification is through regentrification. Right. Many of us are so in a hurry to get out of the communities that we come from. Darn. That when we exit that we forget how promising they are. Right. It is rumored that European settlers saw Mansa Musa and recognized the value of Africa. Yeah. They saw the gold, they saw the diamonds. They were in awe that a black man had access to this level of living. Wow. <laughs> right. Later on, European set out the quest of colonialism. Uh -huh. And they said, we want what y'all have. Right. And that's what take education it. is doing. That's what it's done. That's right. That's what it's done. The power that we have is now you see young black millionaires and billionaires and uh, aspiring or entrepreneurs, black designers who are able to be financially stable. Don't be so in a rush to leave. Mm. Look what you have. Right. They want what we have. And you no longer want it until someone else has it. Mm. But if you're able to create popular avenues and build with those blocks, you can create the world that you want. And it's imperative that we come back into the communities and we begin to rebuild, we begin to reshape, we begin to look at those abandoned buildings like fortresses. Right. Instead of just bandos. Right. Oh, that could be the next child development center. That could be a school. That could be a homeless center. That could be a learning institution. That could be a foster care. That could be a re-entry program. Right. Stop limiting your options by what your, your inability to see bigger than what's available. You know, it's interesting. Our community has been indoctrinated with lifestyle. You know, they see a Mr. Fab on TV, or they see a Mr. Fab at the Dope Era store on Broadway, and they want to be like you, right? So what do you tell this, this generation, these young kids, of what it takes to actually achieve success and to follow your dreams. What's the blueprint? Because I think a lot of times our kids, 
our community, you know, we gotta, I gotta have it now mentality, right? I, I want the whip, I want the drip, I, got, I gotta have the crib, I gotta have the girls, whatever it may be, right? But sometimes the tools that are required are underdeveloped. And I think we have, correct me if you think I'm, I'm off here, but I think we haven't done a good enough job in some of our areas of influence to steer these kids to know what it takes so we can start planting those seeds for those next entrepreneurs to be thinking with the mindset of ownership and coming back in the community, not moving away. How do we, how do we ensure that this narrative of ownership and re-gentrification is seeded with these kids today? I don't think that we've not stepped up to the plate to adhere to a good example, because there are great mm -hmm. examples. There's definitely great examples. What I don't think is that our culture amplifies those examples. Right. Because we promote the poisons. Yeah. Why is that? Why, why do we do that to ourselves? To do. Okay. We've been indoctrinated to glorify the dude that just got out of jail. Cause he are, mm -hmm. he's still for something. But we've been looked at to condemn the brother that just graduated from college. Right. We think he better than us. <laughs> that part. Yeah. But we'll tell him, you think you better than us. Mm. But we'll project our insecurities on his education. We've been taught to popularize the dude that sell drugs and dehumanize the man that uses drugs. Right. When they're actually the same person, they're addicted to drugs. Mm. One's just selling it and the other's just using it. Right. They both addicted to drugs. So the way that we allow things to be perceived is the poisons bring the profit. Mm. And the positives, it's not a narrative that we wish to indulge in. Everybody wants the fast money. We got to blame the microwave. <laughs> right, right. So what are you doing in your career at this stage when you have a songbook of albums, credits as a writer, you have an empire that continues to grow. What's next for Mr. Fab right now? What are you focused on? I'm focused on continuing to grow. As a person, first of all. Right. Beyond what the public identifies me as. Who am I when I look in the mirror? Am I confident mm. with, with where I am? Not where I want to be. I'm thankful that I'm not where I was. Right. But I'm appreciative of the growth. And I'm excited about the future growth. Mm. Um, my involvement is continuing to evolve as a businessman, as we talked about earlier. But elevating from a hustler to a businessman requires a great counsel. Right. So allowing myself to be in the committee of those that have done it, that are doing it, and receive that counsel, receive that mentorship. Right. For me to be able to feed it back to the next generation by leading by example. Um, admitting and acknowledging what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. What I'm not so good at. Right. And I think my confidence has always weathered what I'm not so good at, even if I wasn't that good. Right. At, we, we have to be, we have to be. I was confident that I could do it. That's right. And uh, a dire need to continue to be relentless. Right. That's what has gotten me here this far. Um, but if we just talk about things that are tangible, more stores, the clothing store is thriving. Sure. It's continuing to build. Um, right. Even two or three years of pandemic problems, we're mm. still able to stand still. Talk, talk to me about that. Talk to me about the influence that the Dope Era stores and brand has had on the city of Oakland and types of folks. I see people all over 
the country wearing Dope Era now, celebrities, et cetera. I mean, how have you built that brand and used it as a platform? Well, it's just hard work, man. Um, my brother's a curator that uh, he does all the designs, a graphic designer. It's amazing, man. Yeah. Continues to work. It's my father's son, my real actual wow. father. Um, my best friend, who uh, who I lost last year. Yeah. Um, Condolences. He and I would sit up and <laughs> we would just crack jokes about certain things that we wanted to do. Yeah. Wanted to create this thing like a rap world where it was a building where everything was in, in this world. Yeah. And it was like, you know, you had the studios, you had the clothing stores, you had right. the clubs. It was just a a microcosm of everything that we thought about and we would laugh and we would we would just ride and joke about it. Yeah. Little to our but knowing that this would be the dope beer and we would create it. And without G Field, my right hand man, without him, a lot of this stuff wouldn't be possible. I think I would have been gave up. Really? You know, he would always feel my motivation, man. He was the, he was like, and and I don't want to diminish him to a role of a Bundini. Right, right, right. But he was he was like that for me, you know. And still. And still, you know, brother. Even, even in as he has ascended, he's still that in my heart and my spirit. Because any time that I feel like a days ago about my. Whatever I'm doing, I can hear his voice. Yeah. Like, fool, when you come this far to just stop. Man, yeah, yeah, you, you touched me with that. Man. You touched me with that because so we all go through our different challenges, right? And you have to have that mindset and still, mm -hmm. right? Right, and and not allow things to marginalize, you know, what you can do. And, mm -hmm. and the influences that you've had in your life, you know, from your parents to to your friendships, I know I've shaped you as a father. For sure. That's yeah. That's my greatest accomplishment to this world. Yeah, man. And, and shout out to your daughter because I see your posts on social. You know, we, we, we got to support. I got to bring my kids by here. They saw this before it was finished. But just to give them that inspiration, you know, of like you can do anything you put your mind to. You know what? I want to thank you. <clears throat> and I never got the chance to tell you this. I don't. It's like a touchy subject for me to talk about. It's all good. The game that you had me throw out the first pitch. Yeah. That was the first time that my daughter met my son. Wow. Wow. And it was a moment for me. Yeah. That's what's up. That's what's up, man. You never know, right? <laughs> my man. You know what I'm saying? You never know. It's tough, man. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Parenting and co-parenting and balancing relationships and friendships. All of that. It's, yeah. uh, it's yeah. a difficult task. Brother. Man. You know what I'm saying? It's a difficult task. Next time you come, we're going to have some, we got some different beverages. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, man, that was, uh, uh, that was the first time that they got a chance to see you. That's real, man. That's and real. it was grief. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you have my daughter has been my only child for so long. Right. And for me to, you know, start over and have another child, it kind of, you know, it's been my princess. That's been the heir to the throne. And right. It's tough, man. Yeah. You know, it was very tough. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that was just a quick little sidebar, but that was, well, that's, that's, that's the things that you go through. I appreciate that. And um, it's the beginning of trying to strengthen all of that that right. family unit because that's right. to me that's the most important important thing man i don't care about how many songs i've wrote for artists right. or what record did what or to me man the greatest thing is to say man i'm i fathered two beautiful human beings and right. i want to set them on the path to do the unthinkable absolutely you know, I want them to be able to do whatever it is that they could think of. Right, right. Without having to worry about how will it be funded or without having to worry about, will they like me for this? Right. What they gonna say about it? 
Right. Unwavering confidence. Unadulteratedly. Right. As a parent. And this kind of piggybacks what you said as far as the examples of changing the new mm -hmm. the old rules and and, and, and creating the new narratives. Right. It starts with parenting. Parenting. It starts with what are you doing for your kids? Exactly. And that's what I want to do, man. I'm, I, I, that's my mission to set out to let them know that whatever you do, stand stern and firm on that confidence on that. Yeah. Yeah, man. No, I appreciate that. That inspires me too, you know, as a father, man. And, and, you know, I like to let the interviews take their own course because, you know, it's, I, I just believe in the spirit, you know, transcending what we talk about, but that's what we need to be talking about. For sure. Cause everything else, I mean, look, when we talk about this show and see things from our side, it's really about making sure we're seeing it from our children's eyes. Right. This city, this community, where do we take our children, right? I think about, we had Kimberly Miller, who was the executive director of Fairyland. She came in, we had to sit down, and we talked about Fairyland. And she said, Fairyland is designed not for our kids. The stories, the storybooks, Alice in Wonderland, those stories are from generations past that weren't built for black and brown children to experience and know about their culture. So she told me that the future of Fairyland is going to change. It's going to reflect stories of us and our culture. That inspired me. So I said to sure. myself, what else should we be doing in Oakland? Where should we be telling our children to think about for their children, right? And how we need to model the city, model our destinations to be inclusive. What are some places that you like to take your kids in town? Um, well, I have a teenager now. Right. It's always <laughs> somewhere that's money. Yeah, yeah. That's and it's spending money. It's either a shoe store. Right, or right, it's, right. A, uh, it's somewhere that involves yeah. Dad swipe yeah. a swipe a swipe. <laughs> <laughs> but no, nah, yeah. um, I'm so blessed, man. To my daughter is very like she likes, she likes museums. She Definitely. likes, you know, she she Definitely. likes. She goes to the museum. She want to go to the city to to study the architecture. So she, you know, she, her, dope. she wants to get into designing and engineering. You know, stuff. She's just super dope. She'll sit up and. Look at the bridge and be like, okay, wow, it's form. Wow. Then she'll go back to like uh, Sims or whatever the game is. She's playing the, the Roblox. And yeah, man, my kids love that. And she'll be like, Dad, look what I created. Wow. Like, oh, that's crazy. And it'll be like a direct image of what she watched. Wow. So she's incredible when it comes to that. Now we, she's a, she's entering the engineering program in high school, okay, like that. So she definitely has. She already has it set out. You know what she wants to do, man. I love and, that. And in that round, but, um, where do you spend time man? where do you, where do you like to hang out when you're, when you're in the city? I'm at the dope beer store. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's like the Clark, inner store, man. It's, like, it's not just a store, man. It's like a, it's a vibe. Huh? Huh? What's up? Let's, let's shout out to Unc. Yeah, shout out to Unc, man. It's always a movie. Man. Man, tell, wait, let me talk about Unc for a minute, man. I should have had Unc come through. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what's, What's your relationship with Unc? What what role does Unc play in your life, man? Because we see him, and you know, obviously, it's it's, it's deeper than rap. It's like uh, I'm a big fan of Harlem Nights. One of the best one movies. Of my favorite movies ever, all time. Right? And it's crazy because it sways like the, it, the the relationship sways like it goes from. <laughs> He sugar, which was Richard Pryor. Right, right, right. And me being quick. Yeah, quick, exactly. Then it Eddie. go then it, which is Eddie Murphy. Right. Then it goes from me being sugar and him being Red Fox. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, you right, know what I mean? Right. It's and, and it's we play that fine line of it, man. Um but uh he's uh 
we are like the 2022 Sanford and Son. That's where it is. Okay, I see that. Y- y'all could have a show. Like, you know real talk. Like, like we're we're that. Like on on all levels, though. Yeah, like yeah. you know, um, I envision this would be the relationship that me and my father would have been able to have. Got it. You know, I see that. Um, and he he reminds me a lot of my father from, especially you know his his past addictions of what sure. he was involved in. Sure. You know, and and for yeah. so many years of being a. Uh, um, you know, his, his struggle with, with a drug addiction, you know? And what's the relationship? How is he related to you? Unk is just, uh, the funny thing is Unk was one of my childhood best friends, real uncle. Okay, bet. And we would always see Unk in the neighborhood. He would always be, you know, yeah, with him at the time, you know, mm-hmm. messing up. He was doing what he was doing. And I got a phone call from my homeboy, my homeboy who's, who's, he's doing life in prison. Okay. He was like, man, I'm finna get out, man. And man, I don't want him to go back to jail, bro. Like if you got something for him to do, bro. Right. Like, you know. Right. See, see Take care of him. Take, Take care of you know, Yeah, yeah. Look out. Yeah. You know, look out for me. Right. And me and Unc had a conversation with dad and I was just like, hey man, bro, if you stay out of jail, bro, I'm gonna create a way for you, and I'm gonna just like you gonna be the the everybody's favorite uncle. Right, right. He's like what? I was like, bro, just trust me, man. If you stay clean, stay out of jail, <laughs> man. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm gonna turn your life up, man. Right. We're gonna do it. It's gonna work some crazy magic right. together. Right, right. And man, it's been a crazy journey. Like Unc is like, Unc is officially everybody's uncle in Oakland. Like, you know what I'm saying? Officially, unofficial. Like, Unc, Unc is like, it's just, I man, see it. I see it. I feel it, man. I'm so thankful for him, though, man, because, you know, he gave me a father-like figure, right. you know, right. to confide in, a big brother, right? a motivator. All of that. Um, and, you know, and, and, and a relationship with the uncle that I never had. Mm. And I never got a chance to have a relationship like that with my uncles and and things like that. My right. dad's brothers are, you know, older, very very much so older. And, right. Um, my mom had one brother, and um, me and up, you know, I, I love my uncle Guy. He, uh, but we never had that everyday kicking relationship sure, like that. Sure, so sure. you know, we just embodied that man. And, yeah. You know, the world. You couldn't tell us that we really wasn't. Related. related we all got family like that yeah i mean yeah but, you know blood just blood makes you related you know relationships make you family absolutely i love that man so thinking <clears throat> thinking about when you're not at the dope era store and you're cruising the town where do you go where do you like to post up when you need a break man i had your destination man right uh, have your destination have your destination man you know it's a it's a lot of spots to go i love you know I'm a, you know, I'm a foodie. I love eating. I go different spots. Um, Touch of Soul, Southern Cafe, Everett and Jones, um, Taco Trucks. Yeah, I think I see you at um, Le Cheval a few yeah, times, sure, too. Sure. I didn't yeah. play that heavy. <laughs> um, heavy. You know definitely, miss definitely. Mexican Cali Rose, you know. Oh, the man. Piece of Mexican Cali Rose, you feel me? You was a real one. You feel me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh you know you come down to jack london man you know you could see like if you fly a female from out of town you know you bring right. somebody in town you could right. fool them you'll have a thing <laughs> oakland is the greatest place you're like oh, oh my god <laughs> right i swear to god, i had a great time we were, we were in london jack jack london right. we, in london. Jack london. we went right and, right uh, you know you could do all of that stuff man it's a lot of it's a lot of things to do and it's so crazy that you don't realize how much it actually is to do True. Like True. it's a lot of stuff to do in Oakland. You know, Fab, Oakland over the years has been known for its nightlife, known for its music, known for its clubs. And this generation was figuring out, I think, what that next wave of destinations, like if we gotta go to a nice night on the town, where are we gonna pull up, right? right. And you got something for us, I'm, I'm hearing in the streets that that's brewing. Tell me about it. Um, we have a nightclub. 
a nightclub I named after my mother. Um, it's called Desi's. So, um, the grand opening. By the time the world sees this, we will have a grand opening. We have already had that uh, to be able to be functioning and moving. A lot of responsibility. A lot. You know, a lot of responsibility. You know, so it's the the tedious things. Right. Um, it's crazy. It's like, and, and I'll continue to reference back what I was saying as far as from hustler to businessman. Right. Right. That's why it's important to make that transition. Right. And then what you can't personally do on the physical level, understanding the power of delegation, giving those responsibilities to individuals to run. I can't I can't run the dope bear store, run the nightclub, run it's run too much. And I can't yeah. you know, y'all yeah. go crazy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um but I have some great mentors. I have okay. some great mentors. Jeffrey Pete. Jeffrey um, Pete is a uh, he's the godfather of Oakland Knights. Shout like, out to Jeffries. He's someone who uh, I admire and I love him um, for what he represents of Black excellence. Right. Uh, Chris Rochelle. Gotta um, love Chris though. Uncle Jeff. Uh, yeah. There are so many different people that like. I'm mentioning the Black prominent. Like right. nightclub owners and Absolutely. things like that and, and shakers and movers that have a history of it. Um, it's a young guy named uh, Oscar. Right. Oscar owns a club called Complex and he's been dealing with it, evolving as a young man, right. learning how to, to balance responsibilities of the things that he's been dealing with. Absolutely. But he's bringing the nightlife and the hip hop culture and allowing you know that to give people places to go. Um, brother named Rich. Mm -hmm. who owns uh, Caribbean, Level 13, the Lux Club. Like, he, right. owns, he owns three nightclubs in Oakland. Right. Um, always giving me a great, you know, great insight and tutelage. So saying all that to say, man, you know, the, the nightclub is called Desi's Club Desi's. Um, and then in the midst of that, uh, a four, I actually mentioned other places that you could visit as well. Definitely. Visit Complex. Visit Hello Stranger. Hello Stranger. Miranda. Right. You can visit uh, the end zone. End zone. Um, M2. Can, M2. Right. Uh, Solmar. Right. Uh, Shout out to all these venues, by the way. You Don't know, they're, they're and, and these are clubs. Um, Crybaby, which is a new club. It's, right. Uh, and so there's different, there's de uh, um, second half, I think, second half, halftime. Halftime, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's some other spots, man. That's like you know, some, some some nice clubs. So there are some spots to go. We're actually um, there was a meeting yesterday. What's actually happening is the businesses in the downtown area. We're trying to create an entertainment company uh, and and just a faculty and facility of uh, brothers that are fraternizing, brothers and sisters that are fraternizing and creating a, a board of what we like to say a board of interest of how can we protect our nightlife absolutely how can we invest in it how can we amplify it how can we you know keep it safe keep everything's uh copacetic amongst sure. the business owners right and um it's it's dope to see that being you know being uh facilitated that's right i like to call that cooperation right you know we're all working together yeah, for a common, competition yeah, yeah it's cooperation yeah, definitely, definitely you know what i'm saying I like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so tap in next time y'all get together. Say, hey, my brother Ty said we got to cooperate, cooperation. Yeah, I like that. I like <laughs> Definitely. That. Well, Fab, man, you inspire a lot of us, brothers. So I just want to thank you for taking the time. I know you're a busy man, just joining us on set today, being a part of this movement. Well, we all got our situations that we're trying right. to invest in and showcase our talent, you know, showcase our potential and our dreams. And, and thank you for for giving me an opportunity, brother, to, to sit down here and I appreciate it. In, in, in closing, I want to talk the biggest thing that's on my plate right now, and I want this to be amplified and talked about. I have a I have the Dope Bear store, the clothing store. We have the Club Desi's Nightclub. I have the Dope Bear Nail Shop. I have, uh, I recently just acquired the Dope Bear Cannabis Club, which is gonna be, you know, super dope, black and cannabis, uh, to be able to be a part of this. 
of ownership, not just somebody who was qualified for the equity side and allowed other people to go use their name and profit off them, but to actually have ownership, majority ownership hmm. in a cannabis club. That's next in the Dope Bear Cannabis Club facility, but the ultimate goal is the Dope Bear Academy. And the reason why I'm adamant in looking at the camera because I'm gonna look at all of the people out there and say, we can't complain about the current situations if we don't invest and the future opportunity. Mm. And the future opportunity is realizing that these kids need tutelage, they need guidance, they need mentors, they need someone that can say, I'm willing to put up whatever finances that is required to help these children change the climate of the areas that they come from. We are creating the new narratives. And in that education, finance, capabilities, the duality, and allowing these kids to be who they are. Let's stop trying to change them to fit what we want them to be or what we feel like they should look like. The new politicians dress like this. Stop judging these kids by what they dress like and stop trying to change them to conform to what you feel like they should be and allow them to be them. Allow them to be them because what you'll begin to find is that in the darkest areas of life lies the brightest individuals in life and once that brightness is illuminated the world will benefit from the sunshine and the array of light that's glowing from these souls that you tried to condemn as being demented or disenfranchised just because they don't identify with what one should look like you know let them be who they are and embrace them. It is not getting them to where you are because that transition may take too long, but it's the transformation of meeting them where they are and watching them gradually develop. And we plan to do that with the Dope Era Academy on all facets of building through whatever it is that they want to do and watering that and those seeds will grow. They are away. Watch your feet. Oh. Always a pleasure, my, my man. man. Yo, what's going on? It's Mr. Fat Man, and you're watching See Things from Our Side. Hope you get a chance to see what's going on in the town, Oakland, California. What up? Mm -hmm.